Welcome back to my video series entitled One God, Understanding the Singularity of God in Light of the Distinctions Between Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. In the previous video, we took a, a deep look into John chapter 1 and verse 1, comparing this verse with the entirety of Scripture. And we learned that the word logos in the Greek, it's not a different person beside God the Father in the beginning before the worlds were created. The word, the logos, we learned is actually referring to the divine expression, the thoughts and intents of God's heart, his plan, his reason and purpose. And so God's heart, God's plan was with him in the beginning, but not as a different person beside him. No, the logos was God. And we also learned that eternal life, when we looked at 1 John chapter 1 and the first couple verses, eternal life was with God the Father, but not as a different person beside him. And in this video, we're going to learn about Yahweh's arm. We're going to learn about God the Father's arm as we read in the Old Testament and how this sheds even more light on the Logos, the word of John chapter 1. And so in God's word, we learn that wisdom, love, life, glory, power, strength, these are things that are written as being with God in that they belong to him, they pertain to him. They're all contained in the Logos as his divine expression, the thoughts and intents of his heart. But we also read at the same time that he is those things. God is love. God is wisdom. God is life. All these things are with him, but they are him. And to better understand this, we can see how the words that we speak are with us. They're a part of us. They dwell in our heart, but they also reveal our heart. In essence, who we are. And so in Matthew 12 and verse 34, we can learn uh, this important truth that Jesus is, was speaking. And he says, O generation of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So the words that we speak comes forth from our heart. And then over here, I've turned to Proverbs 23, uh, 23 and verse 7. It says, For as he, that is a man, for as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So we can see here this understanding of the words that we speak being with us, but in essence they are us. And with God, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God spoke everything into existence through his word. But his word began with a thought. His word began with a plan. His word began with, with all the thoughts and intents of his heart. And in essence, all the thoughts and intents of God's heart is who he is. And so the word, logos, in the Greek, when we turn to John chapter 1, again, we looked at it in the Strong's to see the complexity of it. It's something said, but not just something said. It includes the thought behind what is said. By implication, a topic, also reasoning, the mental faculty, or motive, by extension, a computation, the divine expression. So all of this is what is contained in the Logos, the understanding of what's been translated into English as a word here. So this is everything in God's heart, his plan, thoughts and intents, was with God and was God. God's plan, his heart, fully expressed, fully revealed and manifested, we see by comparing Scripture with Scripture, is Jesus Christ. Everything in God's heart that is expressed fully, his life, power, glory, love, wisdom, the list goes on, is fully manifested and revealed to be Jesus Christ. And so when we consider what the Word of God presents to us about Jesus Christ being the Lamb of God, and how he was foreordained before the foundation of the world, we need to consider all that uh, God's Word has revealed to us from the Old Testament, and, and then we need to recognize that what's written in the New Testament um, needs to uh, not go against the things that we learn from the Old Testament. And so in 1 Peter chapter 1, 
Verse 18 says that we were not redeemed with corruptible things. Again, Peter's writing to born-again believers. We weren't redeemed with corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. So here, some people read their preconceived ideas of multiple persons in the beginning that make up God into this uh, verses like these. And so they think that in order for Jesus Christ to be foreordained before the foundation of the world, that he needed to exist as an eternal son or as the son, a different person from the Father in the beginning. But all this is saying, when we look up that word for foreordained, it's, it's prognosko in the Greek, and it, it simply means to know beforehand, that is to foresee or foreknow. So God foreknew what he was going to do in Christ before the foundation of the world, but was actually manifest in these last times for you. The apostle Peter, writing in the first century, he says, was actually manifest. So that foreknown plan of God, it was in his mind when he created the world. It was in his plan. He created the world through that plan. He spoke his word. Everything contained in that plan, his expression of love, of wisdom, uh, strength, and power. And God had his plan of what he was going to do to save mankind by manifesting in the flesh in his mind and in his plan all along. And he created the worlds by and through that plan. And so we need to allow Scripture to interpret Scripture and not read our own preconceived ideas into texts such as 1 Peter 1 verses 19 to 20. And I'm going to keep this up here on this screen. And over here, I want to turn to Revelation chapter 13. In verse 8, because it talks about the Lamb, referring to Jesus Christ, slain from the foundation of the world. Now, are we to conclude that Jesus Christ, as an eternal person next to the Father, was actually crucified before the worlds were created? Did this happen in the beginning? Well, it says he was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It says over here that Jesus was foreordained before the foundation of the world. No, we're to understand that Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world in God's heart and plan. And so Yahweh God, the Father himself, made the worlds through his foreordained plan by speaking forth his word, the thoughts and intents of his heart. He created all things in and through his Son, the plan of the incarnation, not through another person beside him in the beginning. And we're going to look at scriptures that show us that God put that foreordained plan into action. In other words, the Logos was made flesh in the fullness of time, not in the beginning, not from eternity past, but, but in the fullness of, of time on a particular day. God, Yahweh himself, the Logos of John 1.1, 1, 1, was manifest in the flesh on a particular day. And so when we turn to 1 Timothy, keeping in mind that there's only one God, and that is the Father, and his name is Yahweh, 1 Timothy 3.16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Yahweh himself, the Father, was manifest in the flesh. God fathered a son. And that son was him experiencing a limited human existence. He took upon himself the form of a servant for the suffering of death, for the salvation of mankind. And so by turning to 1 John chapter 1, in the first couple verses, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life, the logos of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the father and was manifested unto us. So eternal life was with the father, just like the logos was with the father. It was his plan. It was his intent. All the thoughts and intents of his heart his love, his wisdom, all contained in the words that he spoke. He did everything by and through that plan, that word, that logos. And so eternal life that was with the Father was manifested, meaning his heart and his plan was expressed. It was revealed. And that's when God was manifest in the flesh. Life that was in God, according to John chapter 1, I believe, verse 4, was manifested unto us. 
And so John chapter 1, when it mentions the Logos being with God, the divine expression of God's love, wisdom, power, glory, and life, all that he is, the thoughts and intents of his heart, was expressed fully when Yahweh himself, the Word, was made flesh. Because the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Yahweh himself, God, Father to Son, God the Father, incarnated in the flesh when he fathered a son. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 19, helps us to, to recognize who the person of Christ is. When we read the entire chapter, it, uh, the Apostle Paul here likens our bodies to tabernacles or houses that our spirit dwells in. And it reveals our spirit to be, to be who we are. The spirit that dwells in, the, in these earthly bodies is ultimately who we are. And what we do in our body is going to be judged, whether it be good or bad. And so with that understanding, read the entire chapter. We get down to verse 19. After saying all that about ourselves, he then says to wit that God was in Christ. Yahweh himself, Yahweh God, the Father, was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. God was in Christ. So the, the person of Jesus Christ is God himself. And like your very person is your spirit that dwells in you. With regards to Jesus, God was in Christ making Jesus God, albeit a genuine human being. God walking this earth as a man. And so the word, Yahweh God himself, became a man, a genuine human being, through the incarnation, on a particular day in the fullness of time, not in the beginning, not from eternity past. So when we turn to Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, we can see the details of what Scripture presents to us. He, it says, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. So notice it wasn't in the beginning. It wasn't before the worlds were created. But when the fullness of time was come, God put his foreordained plan into action when God sent forth his Son. And we learned in the previous video how God sending forth his Son is not saying that uh, the Son existed with him as a person next to him in the beginning. But God sent forth his Son in a, in a particular way. How? Made of a woman, made under the law. So that's how God sent forth his Son. The Son did not exist in the beginning. The Son came to exist when God was manifest in the flesh. The Word was made flesh. And that goes right along with God sending forth His Son made of a woman. So we can't uh, separate uh, these statements from the Incarnation. And people have made mistakes in Scripture by reading things as an eternal uh, occurrence, as something from the beginning, when in actuality this happened in time on a particular day when uh, God was manifest in the flesh, in the fullness of time, when God sent forth his son made of a woman. And we can also turn to Luke chapter 1 and verse 35 to receive more confirmation about the title Son of God, how that's not a term uh, uh, used to describe God in any way um, fr from eternity or, or in the beginning. And the angel answered and said unto Mary, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, also, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. There's some important details that we need to pay attention to. This word, therefore, is there for a reason. Because of what was just said, this is going to be because of what was just said. And so, because the Holy Ghost would come upon Mary, a woman, and the power of the highest would overshadow her, that is the reason that the holy thing referring to Jesus Christ, which shall be born of thee, shall be called the Son of God. So the term Son of God is an incarnational term. It's not used to describe a person that existed beside the Father in the beginning, as if God consists of multiple persons, and, and, and as if the Son is a person next to the Father. No, that title, that term, came to be used to describe Jesus, who was born of Mary, because the Holy Ghost came upon her and the power of the highest overshadowed her. 
And so you need to be aware that tradition, concepts of men have been passed down through the centuries, getting you to believe or trying to get you to believe that God was a son in the beginning and he was a father as well. And the son was next to the father as two different persons um, in the beginning. No, according to scripture, Yahweh God was not a son in the beginning because no mother existed. The Holy Ghost couldn't come upon a woman from the beginning. Humanity didn't exist at that time. No, in the fullness of time, this took place. And that term, Son of God, was used to describe Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ would be called the Son of God because the Holy Ghost came upon Mary and the power of the highest overshadowed her. And so much harm is done if you take that term away from the Incarnation because now you're saying that the son could exist without a mother because we know that there's no eternal mother. There's no mother in the beginning. And so uh, when we read uh, statements like this in God's word, we need to take God at his word, let go of tradition, let go of concepts invented by men and come to recognize that the son of God came into existence on a particular day in the fullness of time. And that was when God was manifest in the flesh, experiencing a new existence, a new manner of existence at that time because of the incarnation, beginning at the incarnation. He remained the transcendent, omnipresent, eternal, invisible God outside of his incarnation in the flesh. But through his incarnation in the, in the flesh, on a particular day, he experienced what it was like to be a genuine human being at that time, not from eternity past. Even though it was in his plan all along that he was going to do that, he didn't actually experience it until he was manifest in the flesh, until he fathered a son, until the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And so we need to understand that the Son of God wasn't made flesh. Nowhere in the Word of God do we read that the Son of God was made flesh. No, the Word, the Logos that was with God, was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's what the Word of God says. And it communicates to us that the Word was God. The Word was Yahweh God Himself. And Yahweh God Himself was made flesh and dwelt among us as the only begotten Son of God, the man Christ Jesus. Yahweh fathered a son. And that son was Him experiencing a genuine human existence. Believing in an eternal son a person next to the Father from the beginning, or believing that the Father created the worlds through a person beside him called the Son is a concept invented by man. It's not biblical. It's found nowhere in Scripture. It's read and forced into Scripture. Yahweh God created the heavens and the earth by his spoken word. He did everything alone and by himself. And his spoken word contained the thoughts and intents of his heart, his plan, his motives, his reason. The divine expression was spoken forth. And that's how we need to understand John chapter 1 in verse 1. And so the one singular person of God, by person I'm referring to God as a conscious, rational being. God is one singular, conscious, rational being. And his name is Yahweh. He is now both Father and Son at the same time, beginning at the Incarnation, only because of the Incarnation. But by saying that, by making that statement that God is both Father and Son at the same time, I'm not saying that He's now two different persons. No, the one singular person of God is now experiencing two different manners of existence at the same time. Yahweh God is the unlimited, invisible, eternal, omnipresent spirit outside of his incarnation in the flesh. While through his incarnation in the flesh, he is a genuine human being limited by a human consciousness that he chose to experience for us so that we could be redeemed. And so in an upcoming video, I'm going to uh, go deep into Philippians chapter 2. And that will help us to better understand the human limitation that God chose to experience for us through the Incarnation and beginning at the Incarnation involving human nature where He received a human consciousness. And this will further help us to understand the distinctions between Father and Son in light of the Incarnation and not with regards to different persons in the beginning. And so I wanted to do that as a quick refresher before going into the Old Testament in Isaiah 
to learn about the arm of the Lord. And this really blessed me as I was studying the Word of God, digging deep into the Old Testament. Uh, God showed me so much in Isaiah and Jeremiah that I'm uh, excited to show you. It was so powerful what it did in me, confirming uh, everything in my last couple of videos about the, the Word of John 1.1 1, 1, and helping you to see it that much more clearly um, regarding the identity of Jesus Christ. And so over here, I want to turn to Hebrews chapter 1 and, and the first couple verses. And then over here, I want to turn to Isaiah 40. Okay, so here in Hebrews 1, and I'm going to leave this on the screen while I uh, turn to Isaiah, but it, it really helps us to understand some important details. So here it says God, and we know it's referring to Yahweh the Father because there's only one God, and that is the Father. But even Trinitarians will acknowledge that it's referring to the Father because verse 2 says, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, and they acknowledge that uh, the Father um, is the Father to the Son. And so God the Father, Yahweh himself, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Now this is key right here. Uh, the Apostle Paul here, writing in Hebrews, he says that God the Father spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. Over here in Isaiah, Isaiah is a prophet. So when we read Isaiah, it's Isaiah speaking uh, the words that God the Father has given him. And so it was God the Father speaking to the fathers through Isaiah. But he says, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, or in his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by or through whom also he made the worlds. And so this is important because in times past, the Father spoke through the prophets, but in these last days he spoke in or through his Son. And this is even further confirmation that Jesus Christ is God himself, Yahweh himself incarnate. Not one of three persons incarnate, but the one singular person of God incarnate. And so taking this understanding to Isaiah chapter 40 in verse 3, it says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. Can't forget what we just learned from Hebrews chapter 1, the first couple verses. This is the Father speaking, Yahweh himself. And it's, he's speaking through Isaiah. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. When you, whenever you see Lord in all caps, it's referring to Yahweh. Prepare ye the way of Yahweh, the Father. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Now, now when I looked at this, God immediately spoke to me, and because I knew who the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness uh, was referring to, John the Baptist, as we're going to see when we turn to uh, Luke. And so the Father here, speaking through Isaiah, says that the glory of Yahweh shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of Yahweh the Father has spoken it. So all flesh was going to see the Father's glory, Yahweh's glory. And also, why? For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it, his spoken word. He declared it, so it's going to happen. It's going to take place. His word will not return unto him void. And this goes right along again with the Logos. It's not only the spoken word, but it's the thought behind it, the thought and intents of God's heart. He speaks forth a word, and he, when he says, the glory of Yahweh, the Father shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, it's going to happen because the mouth of Yahweh hath spoken it. And then real quick, if we go over to Isaiah 42, and we scroll down to verses 8 and 9, again, according to Hebrews chapter 1, God the Father is speaking through the prophet Isaiah unto the fathers. He's saying, I am the Lord, I am Yahweh, that is my name. In my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. It's everywhere in scripture. And so Yahweh will not give his glory to another. And be, he says, behold, the former things are come to pass. And new things do I declare. Again, declare being the things that he speaks. He speaks forth his word. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. 
Again, the power of God's word. He speaks forth his word, the thoughts and intents of his heart, and they come to pass. And he would not give his glory to another. So keep these things in mind when we go to Luke chapter 3. And we're going to not forget what we just learned here in Isaiah 40 about the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. So over here in Luke chapter 3, we have here John the Baptist. He came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And because of that, Luke then says, As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So look at this verse, and then look at uh, what Isaiah had said. And you can recognize it that the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, the words of the Father speaking through Isaiah, is fulfilled when John the Baptist starts preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, pointing everyone to Jesus Christ, and that is the way of the Lord according to uh, Luke chapter 3 here. According to New Testament revelation, that's the fulfillment of the way of Yahweh himself, the Father, being prepared. John the Baptist was preparing the way of the Lord, Yahweh himself, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth. Look at verse 6. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Now this is, this is powerful, because over in Isaiah 40, it says, And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Here in Luke 3, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. So the glory of Yahweh, the glory of the Father, is seeing the salvation of God. The salvation of God is the glory of the Father. And so hopefully you can see how this is referring to Jesus Christ. He is the salvation of God, and it's the glory of the Lord being revealed. The salvation of God, Jesus Christ, is the glory of Yahweh himself being revealed. And so remember back to Isaiah 42, Yahweh will not give his glory to another. Yet we learn that Jesus Christ is the glory of God. He's the glory of Yahweh revealed to all flesh. And so I hope you can see that the only way that Yahweh could fulfill this prophecy was by becoming a man himself, because he would not give his glory to another. So Jesus Christ is the express image of Yahweh's person, God the Father's very person, his very substance and essence. And this is how all flesh would see the salvation of God. Not a different person beside Yahweh, but God himself manifest in the flesh. The Word made flesh. So can you see how Jesus is the glory of Yahweh, the glory of the Father revealed? Not a different person beside him, but God the Father existing as a genuine human being. And it all took place through the incarnation when God, Yahweh himself, was manifest in the flesh. And so John the Baptist was clearly the voice of one crying in the wilderness of Isaiah, fulfilling that prophecy in Isaiah. And he prepared the way for Yahweh. And we see that that's referring to Jesus Christ. He, uh, John the Baptist prepared the way for Jesus. And then the glory of the Lord, Yahweh himself, would be revealed and all flesh would see it. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. It's referring to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the salvation of God. The name Jesus means Yahweh. Yahweh is salvation. And Yahweh became our salvation in and through the incarnation. The Word was made flesh. Not another person from the beginning beside the Father, beside Yahweh. No, Yahweh himself was made flesh and dwelt among us. And as a man, he purchased the church with his own blood. And by understanding this, we can then understand why we see the Father when we see Jesus. Because the person of Jesus, the Spirit in Jesus Christ, is God himself. Just like your Spirit dwelling in you makes you who you are, the Spirit of God in Christ made Jesus Yahweh himself incarnate. With a genuine human consciousness, creating a distinction between Father and Son. Not a distinction of persons, but a distinction between his unlimited, 
omnipresent, transcendent existence as God um, outside of the Incarnation and as a genuine human being with a limited human consciousness through the Incarnation, through His Incarnation in the flesh. And this is the powerful mystery of the Incarnation, not that it happened. The mystery isn't that God was manifest in the flesh. The mystery is how the great God of heaven, who created all things, could become a man at the same time while, while not ceasing to be the eternal, invisible, omnipresent God outside of his incarnation in the flesh. And so this is why in, over here I'll turn to John chapter 20 real quick. Scroll down to verse 28. And so when Thomas answered, after reaching his finger and his hands and thrust it into Jesus' side, after he resurrected from the dead, Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. He came to a full recognition of who Jesus is. Not a different person from the Father that was incarnate, but his Lord and his God. And this is why if you have the Son, you have the Father also. Because of who Jesus is, not the other way around. If you have the Father, you don't automatically have the Son. But if you have the Son, you have the Father, understanding that Jesus Christ is God incarnate, Yahweh himself incarnate, the great God and Savior from the Old Testament, Yahweh himself, manifest in the flesh as our Savior. That's why his name was called Jesus, which means Yahweh is salvation. Yahweh himself is salvation. Not another person, but Yahweh himself is salvation and that all happened through the incarnation so if we look back at isaiah chapter 40 and again compare this with luke chapter 3 and see the powerful confirmation about jesus christ being the glory of yahweh revealed as if that wasn't enough we then get to verse 10 which reads behold the lord god will come with strong hand and his arm shall rule for him Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd, and he shall gather the lambs with his arm, and carry them in his bosom, and shall gently lead those that are with young. And so hopefully you can see and understand what's being said here. You can see these things with spiritual eyes. The eyes of your understanding are being opened to these deep spiritual truths of God's word. You can see that this is referring to Jesus Christ. But it's Yahweh himself, the Father, who would feed his flock like a shepherd. It would be him feeding his flock like a shepherd. It would be his arm that would rule for him. Not another person beside him, but the Father's arm would rule for him. And he would feed his flock like a shepherd. And he would gather the lambs with his arm. Not a, not a different person, but with his arm. And when we look at arm, it symbolizes power. As the arm stretched out, figuratively force and power, this is what we're to understand uh, about the arm of Yahweh. His arm shall rule for him. It's not going to be a, a different person. It's referring to the arm of Yahweh himself. And by comparing scripture with scripture, we're going to learn that Jesus is the power of God revealed. He's the arm of Yahweh. He's the arm of the Father, the power of the Father revealed. It's Yahweh's power to save mankind by, by God manifesting in the flesh, by Yahweh manifesting in the flesh. That was his power to save mankind. His arm shall rule for him. And then over here, I want to go to Isaiah 59 in verse 16. So you can see these things side by side. You can see all the scriptures that speak of these truths. So remember that uh, Yahweh himself, the Father, was speaking unto the fathers by Isaiah here. So the Father saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness, it sustained him. His own arm brought salvation unto him because there was no man, there was no intercessor. So his own arm brought salvation. Not another person beside him. There was no man beside him. There was no intercessor, intercessor beside him. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation unto him. Comparing this with what we just learned about his arm referring to Jesus Christ, the arm of Yahweh 
revealed his power to save, this should all, all start coming together, helping you to see who Jesus Christ truly is. The great God and Savior, Yahweh himself from the Old Testament, manifest in the flesh. And so going back up to verse 5, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, comparing that with Luke 3, uh, it says that, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. All flesh shall see the glory of Yahweh, right here. All of this is helping us to see that the glory, salvation of Yahweh is, is Jesus. The glory, the salvation of Yahweh is Jesus. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. God was manifest in the flesh. And then if we turn to Isaiah 63, there's so much in Isaiah. We're going to get to Jeremiah here in a bit. But if we go to verse 5, again, the Father speaking through Isaiah to the fathers. He says, And I looked, and there was none to help. And I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me. Yahweh brought salvation by manifesting in the flesh as a man. It was his own arm. His power to save, not another person, but his own arm, his power to save. And this goes right along with what we just read in 2 Corinthians 5.19. God, Yahweh himself, was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. There's only one spirit. God is a spirit. And that spirit was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And then I'll turn to a few more examples regarding the arm of Yahweh. And this really spoke to me as well. In verse 10 of Isaiah 52, it reads, And Yahweh the Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. So Yahweh made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. And if you can see these things with spiritual eyes, allow the word of God to open your eyes. To, to just the great riches of his word. This is referring to Jesus Christ being crucified. Remember, in the book of Acts, uh, the Jews from all nations gathered on the day of Pentecost. Jerusalem was a central hub where people from all nations gathered. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. This is referring to Jesus Christ being crucified. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus It came salvation. And so Yahweh made bare his holy arm through the incarnation as a man by being crucified before the nations. And we can see in verse 14 confirming that this is uh, in reference to Jesus Christ. As many as were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. And we then go to the next chapter, Isaiah 53. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord, Yahweh himself, the Father, revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. This is referring to Jesus Christ. But who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of Yahweh himself, the Father, revealed? Well, let's allow the word of God to help us to understand what Isaiah is referring to here as the Father is speaking through Isaiah. So over here, I'm going to go to John chapter 12 real quick so I can have these passages side by side. In verses 37 through 38. But though he had done so many miracles before them, that is Jesus, yet they believed not on him. So he did all these miracles, things that only God could do, but yet they believed not on him. That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? The arm of Yahweh, the arm of the Father himself, is speaking of Jesus Christ being the Father's arm. And that holy arm was made bare when Jesus Christ was crucified. Jesus is the Father's arm, not an eternal Son's arm or a person of the Son, Son's arm. It's the Father's very arm. Jesus Christ is God the Father manifest in the flesh. Yahweh himself manifest in the flesh. 
Yahweh incarnate. God incarnate. There's only one God and his name is Yahweh. But if we also look to Romans chapter 10 and verse 16, we can also see how through the gospel, Isaiah's words here are being fulfilled as well. So it was fulfilled directly. The arm of the Lord directly was revealed when Jesus himself, Yahweh himself incarnate, was walking this earth as a man. That's how the arm of the Lord was revealed. And the things that he did fulfilled what Isaiah uh, was saying here. And then in uh, Romans 10, 16, after Jesus was crucified, after Yahweh made bare his holy arm, he was buried and he resurrected from the dead and ascended into heaven. In Romans 10 here, the Apostle Paul shows how that, that the uh, prophecy of Isaiah is also being fulfilled through the gospel of Jesus Christ. For he says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And then when we go back to Romans chapter 1, this is powerful too. It wraps it all together, helping us to understand that the arm of the Lord and the power of God is being revealed when the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. Now think of the arm of God, the power of God. The arm is representing power. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God, the arm of God, unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That's Yahweh's power. That's Yahweh himself saving mankind. Yahweh's power to save. All what he did by manifesting in the flesh. So I then want to go to Jeremiah. There's some powerful truths here that we can um, uh, relate to what we just learned about the arm of the Lord. And so in verse 12, again, uh, Jeremiah is a prophet. So this is the father speaking unto the fathers by Jeremiah. And so regarding the father, he hath made the earth by his power, by his arm, that power. He hath established the world by his wisdom and hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. Now, does this mean his power, his wisdom, and his discretion are three different persons beside him? Of course not. His power, his wisdom, and his discretion were with him when he created the, the earth. He created the earth by his power, established the world by his wisdom, has stretched out the heavens by his discretion, helping us to understand the proper uh, context of Colossians chapter 1 in verses 15 and 16. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For in him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. So the by here we learned in a previous video, that's uh, uh, in. For in him were all things created, and all things were created through him and for him. And so when we understand what the Old Testament, how the Old Testament language agrees with this, not, sh not establishing multiple persons in the beginning, that created everything, but God, the singular person of God, whose name is Yahweh, created all things by and through his plan, his foreordained plan, which included his plan of manifesting in the flesh. So it included the Son, and he, uh, in the Son, were all things created, and through the Son were all things created. Not an eternal person, but God understanding the end from the beginning, and, and through his foreknowledge, Jesus Christ was the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world, foreordained or foreknown before the worlds were created. It was all in God's plan, the thoughts and intents of his heart, showing his great love, showing his wisdom, showing his power. All of this was spoken forth, and he created it with, that, with those things in mind. And on a particular day in history, the Logos, the Word, was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we can then go to Jeremiah 27, 5 and see a very similar statement um, made by the Father. Again, uh, speaking through Jeremiah the prophet. I have made the earth, the man and the beast that are upon the ground, 
by my great power and by my outstretched arm and have given it unto whom it seemed meet unto me. So here his arm and power are associated. And this is how he made the earth, not through an eternal person that existed beside him, but he made the earth with his son in mind, with the incarnation in mind, all that he was going to do showing mankind his great love for them by manifesting in the flesh and laying down his life in death. And then Jeremiah, if we turn to Jeremiah 32, 17, there's just so much in God's word. It says, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm. There is nothing too hard for thee. He didn't do it through another eternal person or another person beside himself. He did it through his great power and his outstretched arm. Yes, it included what he was going to do through the incarnation. Of course, that was in his plan all along. That was the thought in his tent of his heart to show mankind his great love for us. But it was the one singular God that made the heaven and the earth by his great power and stretched out arm. And then Jeremiah 51, 15. He hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom and hath stretched out the heaven by his understanding. All these things were with God. But ultimately, these things being with God doesn't make them a different person from him. He is power. He is wisdom. He is understanding. That, that all comes from God. That's what he is. And the ultimate revelation of his power, wisdom, and understanding is when he was manifest in the flesh through the incarnation. The word was made flesh. And so I hope you can see by comparing scripture with scripture that Jesus is the outstretched arm of the Father, the outstretched arm of Yahweh, the Father's very person incarnate as our Savior. Jesus is the arm of Yahweh revealed, not another person, the Father's very arm, his power to save manifested to us. Then I want to end by going to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 24 to, to wrap this uh, up and to tie all this together. So the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Corinth, he says, But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Jesus Christ is the power of God. Jesus Christ is the arm of God. Again, arm symbolizing power. Jesus Christ is the arm of God, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Not as a different person beside God, but the power of God himself revealed. The wisdom of God himself revealed. Jesus Christ is Yahweh incarnate. And then I also think in verse 25, it's powerful because it says, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Remember, he had made bare his holy arm. Jesus looked foolish, naked before men. Yahweh made bare his holy arm. So the foolishness of God is wiser than men because out of that, out of that weakness of God being killed, crucified, it was stronger than men because out of that came the resurrection from the dead. That foolishness was wiser than men. And this is the power of God. This is the power of his logos, his plan, the thoughts and intents of his heart coming to pass by him speaking forth his word. The logos was with God. But the Logos was God, and the Logos was made flesh and dwelt among us. And that was the Logos, the divine expression of wisdom, power, and love revealed. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the great God, the everlasting Father, the mighty God, Emmanuel, God with us. I hope God has opened the word to you in a, in a greater way so you can see Jesus for who he truly is, the great God and our Savior, Yahweh himself, manifest in the flesh as a genuine human being uh, so that you could be saved, so that you could receive atonement. And that's how God purchased the church with his own blood. So in this video, we examine the arm of God, the power of God. In the next video, we're going to examine the love of God in greater detail in light of understanding the Logos of John 1. And I hope that this has blessed you and that the eyes of your understanding have been opened to these powerful truths. You can see these things clearly. You can see Jesus for who he truly is. And you can start reading God's word with this understanding in mind 
so that you, you're not going to be deceived by traditions of men, by concepts invented by men. Um, and you can see the word come alive with regards to the person of Jesus Christ. He is the great God and our Savior, the Lord Yahweh himself, manifest in the flesh. God bless you, and I'll see you in my upcoming video.